Yo, uh, WordPress people, welcome back to the WP MRR WordPress podcast. I'm Joe. And I'm Obi-Wan Kenobi. And you're listening to the WordPress Business Podcast. We've got Obi-Wan on the pod this week. What is uh, behind the selection of the one and only Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yeah, I definitely answered that question with my sales hat on. So I think of <laughs> kind of like the customer as the Luke Skywalker of the story and Obi-Wan kind of guiding and directing all of that, if you will. So that and you know, the mysterious aspect of him as well, I suppose, for it fits my personality a little bit. But uh, I was more thinking of that with my sales hat on when I answered that question. Yeah, totally. I'm a big Star Wars guy. Uh, Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan and Boba Fett are probably the two like most picked characters, but Obi-Wan is definitely that like mastermind behind the scene sort of selection. So cool. Did, did you watch The Mandalorian? Yes, I actually just recently, as this quarantine has been happening, my wife and I were like, all right, we got to get in on this Baby Yoda thing. We don't get any of the memes. Let's like get in here. So we just watched that and finished it a, a few days ago. It was pretty good. Did you check it out? Yeah. Yeah. My oldest son is a huge Star Wars fan. So like, I got, I watched 95% of it, I would say, but I was Ooh. entertained and definitely looking forward to the next season too. Yeah, it was pretty good. It was, I thought it was different than I thought it was going to be. It was kind of more geared towards like a kid's teenage audience than I yeah. thought it was going to be. Like it wasn't the like, like kind of dark Boba Fett sort of feel of the Star Wars universe, but I actually kind of liked that. It was a little like lighter. It had some, you know, some funny piece parts in there. Baby Yoda is obviously awesome. And I love that Prince Oberon from, uh, oops, sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> Prince o <laughs> Prince uh, Oberon from uh, Game of Thrones is ends up is the character who plays him. So that was Oh, cool. yeah. Okay. Yeah. My son definitely like he took off with it and had a big affinity for it. So I like it for many. I, entertainment value was really high for me with that. So I, I love Star Wars. Anything in the Star Wars universe, I'm watching generally on the day it comes out. Totally. We're on the same page there. Cool. Uh, yep. We've got two big Star Wars fans here. Folks already know me, but we are pleased to have the one and only Nathan Bliss on the podcast this week. Uh, Nathan, I think we met because of this recent Kinsta webinar we did together. I don't know if we had met before, but that was kind of our first introduction to each other. But it was really cool to be able to do that webinar with you. Why don't you tell folks a little bit more about you, some of the stuff you do at Kinsta, maybe a little bit of your background. Yeah, you bet. So I'm a kind of a sales guy through and through. So I've, I've been in the sales industry for the last 12 years in my career, you know, focusing more recently since 2015 or so. I, uh, 2013 or so, I worked for PayPal which is where I tell people all the time, I, I got my MBA from the School of Hard Knocks working at PayPal. It was an incredible learning experience there. Cool. And just a really, really awesome time to to be in the sales industry. So happy to answer questions in that direction. But after that, I, I kind of grew an affinity for startups from there. Got really involved in kind of the startup community locally in Omaha, Nebraska, which is where I used to live. Was flywheel for a time there for three and a half years. And uh, kind of really wanted to relocate to Dallas and install some opportunities for the future of remote work. And that's a real something I really, really enjoy uh, kind of leaning into, which kind of brought me to Kinsta and where I'm at today. Yeah, super cool. I feel like I resonate with your story a lot because you kind of went from this like bigger company to like working more in the like startup area. And that was kind of the same journey as I went on. I was, you know, a federal government contractor and consultant for a little while before I started doing, you know, working on my own things, building websites, working with WordPress. So that journey definitely intrigues me. I'd love to dive more into the like PayPal experience you have because there are a lot of folks in WordPress obviously have some WordPress experience, but I don't talk to a ton of people who have worked at like big tech companies. What were you selling at PayPal and like what was your work there like? Yeah, absolutely. So I was an account executive in the North American telesales division, which was split offices between Chandler, Arizona and Omaha. So we were selling credit card processing. So we were selling into e-commerce businesses, talking to them about, you know, things like their credit cards, their share of wallet, all of those things, getting them to add PayPal as a payment option to those, which was oh, kind cool. of an emerging thing in payments in the payment space. PayPal was a big part of that. Mm. And, uh, you know, getting them then to bring over kind of the, the other option in addition to just PayPal, which is PayPal could also process their credit cards. So we were competing in, in that, that time against some really emerging companies in that space. Stripe was a big one. 
uh, that was emerging at that time. And our, our friends in Chicago at Braintree were another, which actually became a subsidiary of PayPal mm-hmm. through proxy and extension. So it was an incredible time to learn sales. That era of kind of commerce and the emergence of kind of the 1099 economy happening, coinciding with that was really exciting. And I had the fortune to work with some really talented individuals over there from a mentoring perspective that I was able to really learn sales and the way to do sales really well, the right way, I would say. So super grateful for my time there. It was it was an incredible place to work. Man, the sales experience is something that I feel like not everyone has experience like doing pure sales. And a lot of people hear that word sales and they get this kind of like, feel icky feeling in their gut of like cold calling people or like, I don't know, some people have this feeling like sales is a slimy thing. I have the exact opposite thought because like sales is really what drives WP buffs. We do inbound marketing mostly, as you know, you know, as a head of marketing at Kimsta, you all do a lot of inbound marketing, but Mm -hmm. so it's a little bit different, but I would love to like even dive a little bit more into the sales experience you've had. We've had only one other, maybe a few people who have had like sales experience, but Matt Medeiros has been on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, you know, works over at Pagely. He talked a lot about like sales specific stuff on this podcast. So I think, that, and that got a lot of listens. So I think that these episodes people really listen to and want to know how to do sales a little better. So like, let's dive into that a little bit. Did you have any formal training in whatever quote unquote sales is before you dived in doing that at PayPal? Or did you kind of just learn along the way and you just kind of had that personality that helped you be effective there? Yeah, that's a good question. So I fell in, I fell into sales by accident. And I think many people arrive in sales as an industry and it wasn't their best laid plans or, or necessarily their option A from a career perspective. But I kind of emerged through, a lot of people emerge into sales through kind of the hospitality industry, restaurants and things mm-hmm. like that, which was kind of my first foray into sales. And I had the fortune of working at some really great places along along the way, Cox Communications and some other places along that path. But yeah, I think that back to one point that you mentioned there too about kind of the the reputation of sales and, and when you think about sales and it is an endeavor or an exercise, I think it's fair often to paint sales with that brush where a lot of sales can come off as disingenuous. And as people generally, their disposition is not to is to make a sale and not to help a customer. And I think that's the distinction that I like to make. If you can put on a different hat and if you can come at sales and attack it like it is a problem, whereas not as seeing it as a problem, but seeing it as you're coming alongside your market and the person that you're trying to serve. And if the hat you put on when you do that is that you want to come at that from an angle of, I would like to help you grow and be successful and thrive, Having that mentality as your disposition when you're going into it, I have found to serve really well from a results perspective. So I think that's kind of the distinction I would make and kind of when I think about sales, where I what angle I come at it from. Yeah, that rings very true with me. We try to talk about sales here at WP Buffs more as kind of an, an educational space to make sure people understand kind of the exact expectations of what our services do for people and mm-hmm. kind of let them make the yes or no decision. There's not a lot of talk around like closing sales or stuff like that. It's really just like to call to hop on with people to learn about them, to learn about their pain points. And if WP Buffs is going to be a great fit to help them with that, then yeah, maybe they should sign up for you know a subscription. But if not, hey, maybe there's a freelancer out there who's a better option, or maybe there's just another there's another support option that's better for people. So yep. I totally agree with that. Just kind of just from an approach perspective, sales is not just cold calling and cold emailing like it mm-hmm. was you know 20 years ago. It's changed a lot now. I'd love to dive more into like your current role as the head of marketing and sales. I can't remember the last time I heard someone who was the head of both marketing and sales. That's an interesting kind of combination that I think fit together because it's both like, I guess, like lead generation and new revenue generation. So it's kind of like both of those things, which I think fit together pretty well. But talk a little bit more about how you brought on some of those marketing skills as well because you have some sales experience. Where did the marketing come in? Yeah, it's really by proxy. I think that we were going through these, you know, exercises at Kinsta where we wanted to 
align more closely sales and marketing to create a revenue, not department, but kind of the under, bring both of those together underneath the same umbrella. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I think the handshake between those two needs to be really, really great. So right now, that's kind of my sole goal and purpose is to kind of create a organization and a culture to where both of those are working in tandem and working really great together to achieve the the best possible results that we can. So that's kind of when I think about my job, I really think about my job as twofold when I wake up in the morning. I want to be a primary driver for revenue generation for Kinsta and Ad Kinsta. That is my 50% of my goal every, every day that I get out of bed. And then the other 50% of how I think of my about my job is I want to make sure that the people that work in those two teams love their job, don't like their job, that they love them. And when they get out of bed every day, they want to shoot out of bed into their work. And that is giving them life and purpose. And and that means a lot to me. So I meet very regularly with team members, maybe even more so than, than is suggestive of a role like mine, because I want to always keep a great pulse and I don't want that rhythmically to only happen twice a year. So I, I like to meet with my team members more regularly. That's kind of the overarching vision for my role at Kinsta and how I think about it when I wake out of, you know, get out of bed every morning. Yeah, you kind of nailed it from a marketer's, or excuse me, from a manager's perspective, I think. I think a lot of people think about the head of marketing and the head of sales. Like, you must know everything about sales and everything about marketing. I'm sure you know a lot about both those things, but mm -hmm. equally as important as understanding the technical aspects of revenue generation is mm -hmm. being a good, like, manager and understanding that your success is not equivalent to the team's success. And I think a lot of people have this thought in their head, right, of like, if I focus just on the customer, like, and the customer needs and the customer pain points, I will be good and I can grow, a, you know, a company. I think that's true for some people at a company, but actually I don't think that's always true for the, the leaders or the managers. I think those people should actually be focusing on their team. Yeah. Not as much the customers because the team should be focusing on the customers. It's your job as a manager to make sure your team is as successful as possible as a, as a whole, not just kind of as an individual. So I'm totally behind that. Had you managed like a big team before you had gotten to Kinsta or is this kind of like your first like management foray slash how many people are kind of working under you at the Kinsta marketing yeah. sales teams? No, I, I had the fortune to do so during my time at Flywheel and that was kind of my first foray into those waters. But I read something that really stuck with me when I, when I made that leap or transition. I read a blog post that said, the skills it takes you to become a sales manager are independent of the skills it takes you to be one. And when I read that, because I had been, you know, running and hustling and having a pipeline and kind of singing for my supper for the better part of eight years in my career, when I read that the first time, I was like, I don't agree with that. I think I know what I'm doing. And I think I have a good idea of, and a good understanding of what I'm getting myself into. Mm -hmm. And about three months into that exercise, when I was next to going crazy, because I, I, I thought that I knew what I was getting myself into, I remembered that I read that and how true it was. And I think that when you're making those transitions from a career perspective, often you think that you might be re more ready for those things than you really are. And that's been really true for me kind of in this next step in my career where, where now I'm grafting in responsibility for a marketing team in addition to sales. That's not a core competency for me. Mm. You know, I, I cannot go to, you know, certain team members at Kinsta who are deep subject matter experts and some of the things that we do really, really well, because we do a lot of things really well in terms of SEO and how well we rank for certain terms. And there are some things that we've been able to strike a chord that have worked really well to help grow our business. I'm not the experts in those things. So my job is to come alongside those people. And how I think about it on the daily is how do I give those people the support they need to maintain the momentum in what they're doing and then you know enhance it even as well? So the analogy I've used a lot of times is I consider myself to be like bumpers. When you're playing, when you're going bowling, and if my six-year-old daughter was bowling, she's going to throw a lot of gutters. Mm -hmm. But if I throw some bumpers up there, she's probably going to score. You know, I think about myself like that. I, I want to I wanna be able to be there. And that's why I chose Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm there to guide and direct and to help and to come alongside of. But as you know, in Star Wars, 
Obi-Wan Kenobi's not the hero of the story. That's Luke Skywalker, especially mm-hmm. in A New Hope, right? So that's just kind of like, when I think about some of these things, you know, these are some of the thoughts that enter, enters into my brain. Dude, totally. It makes me think about, you know, as like in a CEO role, a lot of times I feel like people think, hey, CEOs are like the top of the pile or whatever. I try to think of myself as like my team members are like, they're kind of managing me. Like in a way, like it's my job to provide the resources and the everything that they need to do their job successfully. So in a way, like I'm kind of working for them. And I think that's what you're kind of saying. And like your role as a manager is, is really just to like provide resources for other people and make sure that they're maximizing their output and their happiness is like you said, make sure they love their job every day. And that's something I feel like really like bleeds out of the Kinsta brand is like, I feel like everyone I talk to at Kinsta like really loves working there and it, it resonates in the people I talk to and even the website. It's just like, it all seems like a great place to work and a great culture and just a great company. Um, so kudos for that as well. I'd love to dive into the, um, like what exactly Kinsta does to drive revenue and kind of what your team focuses on. Obviously, most people know already Kinsta's pretty big in the content marketing space. I mean, people know Kinsta for different things, but my perspective on Kinsta, it's similar to WP Buffs in the sense that it's like a bootstrapped company, like it didn't raise funding and it's grown uh, enormously for a revenue funded company. And it's starting to like be able to fight alongside a lot of the other bigger hosts in the WordPress space, at least from my perspective. And so coming back from parental leave, I'll also say like, I've seen that even more now as I've come back and I'm like, whoa, Kinsta is like kind of blowing up now. Anyway, organic search is a big powerhouse of Kinsta. What other ways are Kinsta trying to diversify its marketing, you know, its marketing areas to continue to drive and scale the driving of revenue? Yeah, I think you you hit the nail on the head. When people think about us in our space, I think they lean into us as a market leader and as a voice for a voice in the WordPress community that they know that we have high quality content. I think that is absolutely well known. I think right now we're from a marketing perspective, we're trying to think through the exercise of the diversification of those strategies. So one example of that was the webinar that we did the other day. We, we want to be able to go into yeah. the market and everything that everybody has come to expect from us in terms of the quality bar being as high as it has been from a content perspective, we want to apply broadly to other marketing channels as well. So that's kind of the next version of Kinsta that we hope that has resonance with the WordPress community and it serves them really well. We want to help them, you know, in new ways than we ever have before. And we know we can be a great source where they can come to learn from us and and learn from our blog and learn from the, the content that we write. However, I think in the future, we want them to learn in the ways that they want to learn in, you know, through mediums like a podcast and mediums like a webinar. So we think that we can keep that quality bar as high as it has been for our written content and apply it more broadly in other mediums of content from a marketing perspective. Very cool, man. It's a hard point to do one thing so well, like content marketing, and then to say, we're going to diversify our marketing and what we do there. WPFs is is kind of doing the same thing. Like our strength is our content marketing. But Mm -hmm. what if like Google hates us one day? You know, we do a great job, you know, keeping out in front of that. And obviously that's a huge focus of ours. But what happens if Google just starts to say, I don't like WBuffs as much anymore? Where are our leads and where's our marketing growth going to come from? So there's a point where you want to, you know, lean on one marketing channel and lean on your strengths. But then you reach the stage where you want to diversify for like safety reasons as well Mm -hmm. uh, as just like growing all the marketing and stuff you're doing. But to do that in a way that keeps the quality as high across multiple areas is also, it's very difficult to do. So like, how do you take all the high quality work you do in one area and uh, and do it in another area? Sounds like kind of webinars is one area you're pushing on. Does Kinsta, and Kinsta has an affiliate program, which is like totally built in-house, which is like, yeah. I find hilarious. <laughs> Because it's like, aren't you a hosting company? Why are you building your own affiliate stuff? And Kinsta is just one of those companies where I was like, well, we wanted to build what exactly what we needed. So we just did it, which I think is yep. pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. But is affiliate kind of marketing also a big focus of growth? Because I know it is for a lot of other hosting companies. Does Kinsta have this approach of wanting to focus on affiliate stuff? Or is it kind of one of the things you do, but it's maybe not the primary driver of, of new leads and revenue? Yep. Good question. So I, I I would actually say the latter is true. Like it is one of the areas 
of marketing that is more in the direction of a core competency and a time-tested method for us where we know what we're going to get out of it. It's more predictive for us in that way. Mm. So I think about it very much in the direction of, of, of some of our other content marketing and how, how we're known for that. Right now, I think the evolution and for us, and part of my presence at Kinsta, is to scale out a team. Because marketing, right, you go through these, and you can relate to this, is as you evolve and grow as a company, as you're going through these exercises where you're, where you're growing and going and growing up, you know, you have to scale out a team and, and those teams, you know, are, are made of members that can be more role specific. Hmm. So that's been a big part of, of the last six months for us is to truly scale out a marketing team and kind of bringing more specialization into that. So we have people on the team right now that are focused on lead and demand gen. We have people on the team right now that are focused on PPC and, and video as a content strategy as well. So we're really excited about the potential that those individuals can come at their roles with the same sort of expertise level that we have in our written content mm. to those other mediums as well. So we're, we're super excited about that. Yeah, I remember when we were kind of setting up the Kinsta webinar we did together, Andrea was part of that conversation. I remember yeah. being like, what does Andrea do at Kinsta? I looked at her signature and it was like video specialist at Kinsta. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. So they're at this stage where, because most small companies start, you know, if you've got a few people on the whole team, everyone's a generalist, right? Like people yep. are doing a bunch of different stuff. But as you grow and get bigger, and especially when you're at Kinsta's size and scale, you have like a marketing and sales teams, people are going to need to specialize, maybe not in one area, but probably in like, you know, one to three specific, you know, areas that they're, they really excel in. They're really kind of masters of those areas. Mm -hmm. I'd love to talk about the, and again, this is just like me personally, I want to dig out this information because I'm super interested <laughs> in this. Um, sure. What has it been like to build out the team at Kinsta, the marketing and sales team from like your specific perspective? Because I think there's a lot of ways to hire people and to bring new people on to build a team. You can be posting on job boards and trying to hire people that way. You've kind of been in the WordPress space for I think like four or so years now. So you may have a network of people you're kind of reaching out to and bringing in. Maybe your company, because they do all this content marketing is all, you're automatically getting jobs come in or people are interested in working there. What did it look like to like go through this hiring process and just the building and bringing on the actual people of the marketing and sales team at Kinsta? Yeah. It's kind of everything under the sun that you just described. You know, it's going <laughs> to, cool. it's very multifaceted in a way, but I tend to stick to the methods that I have learned and the methods that I'm, I have seen be successful in, in the past. So from a hiring perspective, one of my mentors in sales by proxy is a gentleman by the name of Mark Roberge, who you probably know, who was the first salesperson in the door at HubSpot. I'm a big proponent of, of certain of a lot of inbound methodology that I've learned through exposure to HubSpot products and then exposure to people like Mark who, who've written about those as well. So the Sales Acceleration Formula is a book that I would highly recommend people mm -hmm. check out when they're thinking about scaling sales as an endeavor, as an exercise, because I think that he attacked that problem from an angle that has kind of flipped the script for SaaS in general. Mm. He has that that level of reach for me, and he's somebody that, from a sales perspective, is on my Mount Rushmore. So what he has been suggestive of from hiring methodology that he talks about in that book is something that I've adopted as well, just in terms of the tempo and the feel for what that process looks like in terms of candidate identification and then how to kind of work through that process by extension. So something that I would definitely plug would be Mark Robert's book, The Sales Acceleration Formula, because that's really kind of informed the last four to five years of my career and certainly so here at Kinsta on how we think about hiring as an exercise. Yeah. Okay, cool. HubSpot's, I'm a big fan of HubSpot stuff too. I love that they're kind of like... Part of their growth formula is it doesn't stop at like when you bring a customer on, it ends when like your customers are evangelists of your brand yes. and like love everything you do. And that was always something that I said, like, of course, like it doesn't seem obvious if you don't like before you've heard that, but once you hear it like that, like, of course, like mm -hmm. then they become your sales team as well. And you know, your 
like literally the Kinsta sales team is helping to bring people on board. But part of your sales team is also your customer base and the people you work with and telling other folks about it and creating that kind of those micro cycles that can themselves scale. And that is like having your customer base be able to do that as well. So I think HubSpot is a great resource for people. And yeah, cool. How'd you get hooked up with um, at HubSpot? Yeah, Mark Robert wrote that book, The Sales Acceleration Formula. So that's just something that that we've done. But something you said in there actually stood out to me because when you think about creating raving fans, evangelists of your products, I think that, you know, once you have that, I think then you can lean into that. One thing I'd like to do is try and consider myself in sales as a bit of an arbiter where I I want to be somewhat of a neutral party. Now, obviously, I'm going to be an advocate for my products. I am and I will be. And that's why I'm at Kinsta is I think I am, I'm actually... I actually think that our our products speak for themselves in the marketplace. And I think the market has the opinion on that that holds the most true and resonates the most with prospects and potential customers. So one tactic that we do often on on sales, for example, is when whenever I observe, and I, I love Twitter, I love to interact on Twitter. When I see something bubble up on Twitter that is organically happening from our customer base, I'll often retweet it just for the exposure because I love that. But I'll incorporate that into my sales flow too. Mm-hmm. So one thing about me is sales is that I want to be as process driven as I possibly can. So when my team is in what I refer to as the negotiating phase of the sale, where they're we're kind of at this posture where we've already gone through a demo and a discovery call, but we're not yet to the yes or the no. I'm very much like, how can we continue to drive value at that phase cyclically in the sales process? Yeah. So I'll tell my sales team sometimes, Go to Twitter, send somebody, don't send a just checking in email because that is this direction that all the salmon are swimming. Mm. Do something different and surprise you and delight your customers in a way that they don't expect potentially. It's like a curveball in baseball. You know, like if you're just pumping fastballs, you can throw it 105, but major league hitters are going to hit it. Yeah. uh, Because they're that good nowadays. You got to give them something different. So how can you be that voice for an advocate for your customer? And how can you utilize some of these out-of-the-box things? Like a tweet that maybe one of your customers says something really great about your product. Send them that. Don't send them just another checking in email and things like that. So those are some of the tactics that have you know served me well in my career. And, and some actually some of that tactically I learned during my time at PayPal from some really great mentors there. Yeah, super cool. Man, the personal touches are so, so good. My question about that from like your perspective at Kinsta, because you are at this point where you're growing and scaling, you know, sales and marketing. And part of that is going to be to automate some of these processes to be, have it move faster. How do you find that balance between, like, I'll use an example, like if you have someone in that position, like, is everyone on your team sending manual follow-up emails, maybe with a little bit of canned something in there to get it started, but then personalize that email? Uh, is everyone there, like, sending manual emails to every lead that comes through to, at every point where you could just add them to a sequence that sends them, like, five emails in a row or whatever? Or is, like, are you still adding some automations in place? Probably, I assume your answer is going to be it's somewhere in the middle, but I would love to, like, know what a company the size of Kinsta in terms of like having a whole marketing and sales team is doing to find that fine line between we want to send personal one-on-one targeting to people and messaging to people while also, you know, maybe not spending 10 hours a day, just, you know, emailing leads. How does that work? Yeah. Where we're at today will not be where we're at tomorrow. Mm. So what I mean by that is Right now, we're probably using more automation and introducing more of that into the process than I would be suggestive of telling people on a podcast, I would say. Gotcha. The more that you can personalize, the better. But there are these trade-offs that you have to make. And there is only something I'll tell my sales team members all the time is the greatest asset that we have is the time that we have. And how you choose or select to spend it is always a strategic decision. Mm -hmm. And in SMB sales in particular, I think that one of the most underrated, you know, traits of a great SMB sales team or a great SMB seller is velocity and momentum and speed. You know, it's like when you played Madden growing up, you know, a lot of, you know, people that played video games, the trait that they looked for most often is the fastest players on the field. <laughs> and in SMB sales, I think about that a lot, you know, so we, we look to optimize any way that we can 
that will help us go quickly and move faster. So we do introduce workflows and sequences into that as we can, yeah. but it's all contextually driven. If we have a lead that's just a home run lead for us, we're not doing that. We're doing the exact opposite. So you have to be contextually driven when you're, when you're looking at these things, kind of make some assessments and some judgments on the leads that you're seeing and then you're observing and then kind of act accordingly, I would say. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. We've got like a huge lead here at WP Buffs right now. That's like a, a big blog in the WordPress space that gets a lot of traffic that's joining our white label program. And man, I mean, the amount of personal touch, like we're doing research for them to help them pick the right credit card process or like a lot of stuff we don't normally do for folks mm-hmm. that we have, you know, a whole partner hub where people can log in and figure stuff out themselves. But there's like hand holding to the max going on just in terms of making them feel like a VIP customer. So I, th- I totally agree that it's, it's kind of dependent on the clients, but also you nailed the, like what you spend your time on is so important because that's the only thing we really have a finite amount of. Yes, we've got a finite amount of cash. Yes, we've got a finite amount of X, Y, and Z, but time is like hundred percent finite. Like there's absolutely no question about that. So I'm totally down with that. I'd like to ask about sales and marketing kind of like specifically in the WordPress space. Cause I feel yeah. like the WordPress space is a little bit, I mean, I think a lot of people are a little prickly about sales and marketing and stuff, but especially in the WordPress space, there's a lot of like, get your stuff out of my dashboard or like, you know, like, Mm -hmm. I think that that's like a mentality somewhere in the WordPress space from a manager's perspective of like hiring folks. Have you, like, are a lot of the people on the sales and marketing team, like, are you hiring people mostly who have been in the WordPress space already and kind of understand the, like, I guess, complexities of the community? Or are you also and or bringing in people who are like more like you who are from a sales background and kind of educating them about WordPress space? Like, what does that look like? Good question. So I would say at Kinsta historically, we have kind of borrowed from people's expertise inside of the WordPress community. And you hit the nail on the head there. Like there is some nuances to the WordPress community that if you come from outside of it, you don't understand all of those at first. And that's where things like just once you're inside of it and once you've been to WordCamps and you've had the pleasure of meeting people and understanding kind of what the community's more about, the community is a lot about the community and the shared project that is WordPress and, and all of that really coming together. So from a hiring perspective, it does take, I would say it's weighted. We weight that. We weight that in terms of, uh, you know, how we think about that when we're assessing candidates and things like that. So, but make no mistake, like the, I think the future for us is to strike a really great balance between people that understand that about the WordPress community and then also have other skills that they bring to the table in addition to maybe their background in WordPress. Dude, super cool. Uh, I actually have to run somewhat soon because my son has a pediatrician's appointment. He's got his four month appointment, which is awesome. So well, you definitely got to come back on the podcast for listeners because they want to listen to you more too, but just for me personally, because I get a kick out of these conversations and I learn a ton as well. But let's start wrapping up. Um, why don't you tell folks where they can find you online or the stuff you're doing? Yeah, so you can anybody can email me anytime at Nathan at Kinsta.com. Pretty simple there. And I'm Nathan underscore bliss on Twitter. So you know, feel free to tweet me. I love to interact with people there as well. And then I have a, a kind of a side blog that I do very loosely, <laughs> NathanBliss.tech, uh, built on WordPress, of course. But um, I have actually been writing a little bit more recently about utilizing HubSpot to help you in your job search, just because of the mm-hmm. moment we're in culturally. And I did that to great effect in my past. So I'm actually borrowing from some real world examples and writing about that recently. And I'm hoping this serves it as a little bit of a kick in the pants for me to keep going with that because <laughs> I've launched the first two parts of that and I need to get back to the keyboard and, and finish that up. Okay, he said it on the podcast. So folks are listening. If you go to the website and he doesn't have a new post in the last month or so, make sure you tweet at him, make sure he updates it. <laughs> cool. If uh, folks are listening, haven't left us a uh, five-star review in iTunes, we do appreciate it. Make sure you need, leave um, Nathan's name in the comments and maybe something you learned from this episode so we can shoot him a screenshot uh, and thank him for the review. Uh, Uh, If you're a new listener, feel free to go back and binge some old episodes. There's so much to binge these days with this, you know, staying at home stuff. Why don't you binge something? It'll help you move your business forward. We've got, you know, almost 100 episodes of the WPMRR podcast at this point about all sorts of stuff. So go back and listen to some old episodes. If you have questions for us at the show, shoot us an email. We want to do more Q&A episodes. So yo at WPMRR.com. We will feature your question on the show and answer it. That is all for this week, 
Uh, we'll be in your podcast player again next Tuesday. Nathan, thanks again for being on. It's been real. Thanks, Joe, for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks.